Good morning, this is Angela with Parkos Permaculture. I just made a whole video and my phone ran out of memory, so I'm having to refilm a big chunk of this. So I will try and be expedient in redoing it because I have a lot to get done today. I am sitting here hiding in the shade because it's quite sunny out in my permaculture food forest in Portland, Oregon, zone 8B. It's the middle of May. I just kicked chickens out of this por portion of our orchard. Now, you can check out some of my tours from last summer. In June, I did a comprehensive tour of our quarter acre uh, permaculture property. And you can see what my three paddock rotational poultry system looks like. This is one third of the area that the chickens and ducks have access to. And right now it is closed off. I have just moved them out. They have been an incredible force to scratch and turn over and peck and mechanically help break down the four inches of wood chips I put in here. They have decimated the weed seeds and insect pests. The ducks have eaten all the slugs out of here. Now I need to do some work on my own. So I have a quarter acre and that means that I want to cram a lot into my space. I'm going to have to put in a little bit of extra work. So you may find you don't need to do this level of uh, upkeep that I do. I find that it helps me connect more with my garden, be out in my garden working in it. I partner with the plants, with the garden ecosystem to further abundance. When we bought this property, there was no topsoil. I have said it multiple times over my videos. I mean, absolutely none. There was a layer of hard compacted clay subsoil with rocks in it and no organic matter, no microbial life, nothing. So most of what I do here is uh, I'm a dirt farmer and I, um, someone's going to comment every time someone comments and says dirt is not soil. You're right. I am a soil farmer. I am trying to feed the soil and grow a healthy soil microbiome and a rich layer of organic matter so that my plants are healthier. So when I started this garden, I was younger. I uh, made some mistakes early on. Everybody makes mistakes. Permaculture says slow, small solutions so that when you make mistakes in your garden, they are not expensive ones. I planted this section of the orchard knowing all of the trees were going to be really closely together knowing that I was going to have to do a lot of work to keep it in shape. What I've encountered along the way though is that I've moved fencing. I've changed my design as our needs have changed and as I have gotten uh, better at doing permaculture, gotten more intimately acquaint acquainted with my landscape. This right here you can see is a path. What you can see on the ground is all of the green stuff I have chopped out of the pathway so I could access it. So because my design was imperfect, what I have is not only the high level of pruning for intensive agriculture in terms of the trees to keep them close together and doing well, but also now a high level of pruning along the paths to keep paths in existence, to have them not be completely taken over by trees. So in permaculture, we say the problem is the solution. And I found that that's true here. Yes, I have made more work for work for myself and that now I have more chop and drop to do. Chop and drop is where you take green, shrubby, leafy material and you just hack it off at strategic points on the plant and you just you just throw it on the ground and you let it break down. It's like the natural process in a forest where um, tree and shrubby material leaves and branches fall to the floor and are various sizes and uh, they break down on their own. It's really good for building healthy soil. So I have to do more chop and drop just to keep a path open. But because in permaculture the problem is the solution, what I have done in making more work for myself is I have accelerated the process of building healthy soil. I have accelerated that process by needing to be in here more, cutting back my plants more frequently, and dropping more green and brown matter to the forest floor, okay? So it's actually been a really good benefit. It means I have super thick humus in this section of the garden now. Right, this is my duck house made out of free pallets. It's real old and it does a great job. Um, it is incorporated into the fence, so I didn't have to use as much free fencing material. You can see here, this is, again, this is to keep chickens from jumping over my pallet gates. Uh, this is where the chickens are now. They're in here, they are kicked out of here. 
I put in this dwarf mulberry a couple of years ago. I hate it. So I'm gonna be cutting it back real hard. It never fruits. It gets die back in the winter and it's long and leggy and um, not particularly dwarf. I don't like it here. I'm gonna cut it back real hard and think about whether I wanna get rid of it uh, in the winter this year. So that's the first part of my chop and chop. So the second thing I have done after making the hard decision that I'm gonna take out a tree in, in uh, radically reducing that mulberry is I have cut back my Siberian pea shrub. Now Siberian pea shrubs are quite large and in some places they can get weedy. So just be aware the seeds can come up everywhere. I have not had trouble with that because mine never manages to set seed because my chickens eat all the flowers. Um, the greens from it will release nitrogen as they break down, but even more importantly, you can't see from right here because my big honking medlar is in the way, but back behind that medlar is where I have cut the Siberian pea shrub to the ground and it will release nitrogen back into the soil as the roots die back in response to the um, material above ground being removed. I'm sorry I'm distracted. I am really watching this bee. So when I do my chop and drop, I take the vegetative material and I just throw it down on the ground. You can see here is some that I did last winter. It makes for a, an uneven and um, inconsistent and not uh, attractive in the eyes of highly groomed American landscaping standards, but it mimics the soil uh, and forest floor behavior. This will break down at different rates and become soil at different rates, just like it would in nature. So I don't care what other people think, this is what is effective and maybe we need to change our notion of what is aesthetically pleasing. I don't want uniform bark dust. This is what I want because it's helping my trees. So first of all, I have a medlar here one of my favorite late blooming trees. It's a love it or hate it fruit crop. So this medlar, unfortunately, this gate didn't used to be here. The gate used to be higher up. And our, again, our needs have changed, but it means you open the gate and you're, you face plant right into a medlar. So I am removing some of the extra foliage here so that I can get around this tree more easily. Long-term solution is probably strategizing a different place to put the gate. Now, as we walk through here, I'm gonna try and be quiet because my bees are pretty darn active. I have my roses here. Again, continuing to chop and drop. I couldn't get through this path at all. I'm gonna tie back my roses. But this pear tree, this is my suckle pear, had grown all the way over to the fence nearly. And then also it puts up a lot of shoots. You can see I haven't gotten rid of all of them. There's one. I don't want this tree to be taller than probably seven, seven and a half feet. So I need to keep pruning it. So I cut back all of the excess material, all of the water sprouts, and I just want to leave the material that will produce uh, spurs. So this one right here, like this shoot, not, not going to be doing anything. You can actually snap those off with your fingers and throw them down. Now when pruning this time of year, I want to be really careful that I'm not pruning off or damaging my pears. I want to preserve my pears and this tree has set a ton of pears. So again, more chop and drop, more Siberian pea shrub, more pear, and then we get into the main issue here. I would like to move the gate so it's right here and you can come in and go straight back to the bees here. I don't want to remove any more of the pear material on this side because it's all covered in spurs and there's tons of fruit in here. So I'm looking at this big honk and goomy berry. When they tell you they get six feet tall and six feet wide, that is a lie. Goomy berries need full sun. They are nitrogen fixing, which helps my other uh, tree crops in here do well. But this is huge and it has completely swallowed up the path everywhere and it's thorny. So I think I'm gonna do some radical take back of it. I don't need the fruit. I have three other goomies and get tons of fruit off of it. So I think I'm gonna do some big time cutting back of this with my pruning saw today. And the leaves, blossoms, immature fruit and mature fruit are all edible for chickens. So that will go down in and become food for my chickens. Okay, so see, this goomy berry has completely clogged the path and I can't get back through here. That's not safe if I need to escape my garden because my bees are pissed off or just to get through here and I'm tired of snagging my clothes on the thorns. So this was a design flaw, not because um, I messed up in terms of where I planted it, but I messed up in terms of I was new to growing goomies and I underestimated their size. Here is my damson, Shropshire damson. I will be um, 
set quite a lot of fruit this year. I'll be moving this in the winter. I don't like it here and I'm gonna change the location. Again, this should be a path in between the two of these. So I'm working on chop and dropping around my Shropshire Damson to build up the soil and also to help retain water in the summer because I don't water in my orchards at all. So this, this gummy berry is a nitrogen fixer. So just like my Siberian pea shrub, it will release nitrogen when I cut it back hard from root dieback and from the vegetation itself decomposing. Here you can get a look at the section that I'm going to be pruning. It's on the left side here behind this fence. Now to the right is my sun trap annual veggie bed section and here behind the fencing are my beehives, my duck pond, and the trees and shrubs I am pruning today. Stepping back, you can get a better look at how little space there is on either side of the gumi berry and how much I would need to take back in order to make safe, effective pathways between the shrubs and trees. Okay, so you may be asking me, okay, Angela, um, what else do you do in here? I noticed that you have so many videos about fruit tree guilds and there's no guilds in this part. It's just fruit trees and there's a couple of currant bushes and the Siberian pea shrub and you're 100% right. <laughs> this area has so much chicken pressure in it, so much destruction from, not destruction, disturbance from the chickens, it's almost impossible to grow guilds in here. And that's the trade-off of intensively rotating chickens through an orchard, through a food forest, is that the understory gets pretty obliterated by your chickens. So what I do in this part to serve as a sort of functional guild space and maximize use, because this is all wasted space right now, like look at this, this is, there's nothing under here is that I am gonna grow cover crops. And then in the fall, those cover crops will be food for the ducks and chickens, or maybe even later in the summer. I also take all of my old expired annual veggie seeds and I throw them in the ground here. I get pumpkins, I get zucchini. Um, two years ago, I got tons of zucchini out of seven-year-old seeds. Uh, so along with the clover and other things I'm gonna be putting in, I'm gonna put in those extra annual veg seeds whatever grows may be a bonus yield for me that I wasn't planning on, no effort, I won't do anything. Um, I'll kind of let it be a gorilla garden space where like it just does its own thing and uh, it's wild and if I get a harvest out of it, cool. I may not eat the food that I grow in this section. I may have it all be chicken and duck fodder. It may become food for my livestock. That's okay too free using expired seed, using space that's otherwise not utilized. So let me get my pruning saw out and uh, I only have a limited amount of time to work today. I have some other uh, pretty uh, hefty obligations that I have to take care of. So the next couple weeks, I'm gonna have really limited time in the garden. So here is the finished product. I have chopped and dropped a tremendous amount of green material, thinned my trees back without removing fruit or blossom, so that I can more easily access this part of the garden and also especially access and retreat from my bees. The path is much easier to walk now. You can see I've taken out large sections of gumi berry. There is a blue jay in the background that is very mad at me. And one of the things I noticed in really thinning out this gumi berry, which will rapidly send up new shoots, is that there are quite a few motherwort volunteers at the base that were completely obscured by all of these branches. So I'm really excited. I love motherwort, the bees love it. Now you can see I can get through in between my uh, Shropshire Damson and my Gummyberry. It's not perfect, it's a little tight, but I can get through here, there is a path again. Back here with my bees. This is my Siberian pea shrub, which you can see I cut back radically, it will refill. The one thing I did not prune back was my fig. You can't prune figs this time of year. They will leak latex all over you and um, it's not a good scene. It's not good for you and it's not good for the fig. So that will be getting shaped in the winter when it's dormant. But right now, I feel that it's much safer to access my bees. There is a lot more room to walk and get around. This gummy berry will release a bunch of nitrogen through the material I have cut off and through the dieback of the roots in the ground. And I have clipped a bunch as a snack for the chickens today. 
I've also gone around and planted zucchini seeds, kale seeds, dill, old basil seeds, and um, some of my little tiny runts of Cape gooseberry everywhere. I'm not going to throw out the runts. I'm going to see if they maybe will just catch up and do well and produce some Cape gooseberries in here. So let me give you a look from outside the gate. And then I'm going to have to exit my garden for the rest of the day. That's all I've got time for. Here you can see Violet happily munching on the gummy berry, Eliagnus multiflora leaves and blossoms. Oh, and now that I have removed this mulberry, the hops will have much more room to get up and over. There's not so much obscuring them. Hops are a great chicken proof plant, by the way. So let's come out here and look. All right, here is the finished section of my orchard. Now, when we do this kind of radical chop and drop, we are mimicking browsers and grazers, and we are helping the plant get a message that it needs to send out new growth. When you prune your plants, it's good for them. When you prune your trees, it's good for them. It is filling the niche of those uh, browsers that are not here in this system and helping the plants uh, reinvigorate and it can really extend the life of your plants to get the, give them a good pruning. So I'm really excited about how this section of the orchard is looking now. Hopefully the clover and herb and veggie understory crops will begin to germinate here when we get some rain and I feel much safer utilizing this part of the food forest while also building fertility, increasing access, and increasing aesthetics. So I'm really happy with that. All right, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. Please consider subscribing. Let me know what kinds of permaculture videos you would like to see. I hope to be making a video every day. We'll see how it goes. Um, I tr have enough content. I have enough things I want to talk about and share about because I'm so excited about permaculture that I could put out two or three videos every day. It's just that real life uh, gets in the way and I don't have the time to film and edit all that I am doing in the garden. So you only see a small snippet. I'm sorry. I hope that over time I can do more and more. But if you got something out of this, please give it a thumbs up and please uh, check out my Patreon. Also, uh, you can throw a couple of bucks at my PayPal if you got something out of my video, if you don't want to commit to being a patron. Uh, that would be awesome. That helps me make more videos and share more about my 20 year experience in permaculture with all of y'all. And through that shared connection, we all push toward having better permaculture and a more sustainable community of human beings on this planet we are trying to regenerate. So thanks.